The Flood, Season 1, Episode 2 South Hook, Pennsylvania, May 28th, 1889 Diary of Radio Technician George Hatch I received a telegraph early this morning warning of a large storm moving in from the west. It was warned in the message that rivers and lakes had become swollen and spilled over their banks. The storm is approximately two days out, which should give Mr. Unger time to send a crew to ensure the dam was in good working order. It wasn't a secret that Mr. Riley cut some corners on maintenance years ago, and there had been scares of the dam breaking in a sense. The message seemed more frantic than what I had normally seen in telegraphs in recent times. So I delivered it personally to Mr. Unger. Billy stayed behind to listen to the lines and repeat the messages. When I got to the clubhouse, Mr. Unger was in his normal place next to the billiard tables. He seemed uninterested in the warning of the storm. This dam has been here for a long time. I appreciate you giving me the warning, but my crews are busy with other projects right now. We'll take it under advisement. In time permitting, I'll send someone to inspect a dam to make sure it's in working order. He said. Whoever sent that message seemed to be very serious with their words, sir. I said. I serve at the pleasure of the members of the Southford Fishing and Hunting Club. The members have tasked me with several other projects that are very pressing. So when I say that I'll take it under advisement, I will. And thank you for the information. Let me know if anything more pressing comes your way. There's the door. I suggest you use it, before you find yourself in search of another profession. He said. He was never much of a talker, apart from that both sides of his mouth. None of the founding members were much better, considering this oasis was built on the backs of nearly slave labor. I made my way to the hitching post, and the sky was growing darker, which was odd for late morning. A man in a black, shiny suit came walking out of the woods. He was a strange-looking man. Upon seeing me, ditched his stark expression for a glowing smile from ear to ear. He made eye contact with me, but instead of speaking, he kept smiling and walked right past me and down the road, never breaking away. I was plenty used to having folks from out of town do something similar, but this set my stomach into tangles. It was almost as though I was walking up to find him doing something, no good from where he was, but I couldn't determine his point of origin, especially because there was a sheer cliff above where he came out of. I rode back to the radio tower in South Fork. I sat for several minutes, and I heard nothing coming through. This wasn't uncommon, but it started to unnerve me that it was completely silent for as long as it was. Normally, the radio man in Johnstown would send a message in the early afternoon asking for conditions at South Fork. And considering the messages that I'd received went all over the line, I figured he would have asked for updates. Nothing. I tried to send a message out to him, but I found the line to be dead, not sparking as it would normally. Trees on the line would happen from time to time, and considering a storm would be rolling in, it was my task to make sure the lines were clear. I went for a ride with my gear, and it felt like hours, and I came to a pole where the line had been severed, just outside of Bracken Farm. I climbed up, and where the line would have been connected, I saw the line perfectly cut, as if someone had done this. It could have been anyone, or anything. 
After spending half an hour reconnecting the line and mending the cut, I made my way down the pole and gathered my stuff. That was when I saw him standing across from me, appearing. The man with the smile. He stared at me for what felt like several minutes. I broke away from his gaze to find myself shivering and wet in the radio tower. I had no memory of how I got here or why I was wet. I had no idea how much time had passed. It took hours to get there. It must have taken hours to get back. I shivered and made my way to the stove to start a fire. I looked up and saw a red glow was coming through the small window to my right. I went outside to see where the glow was coming from, but saw nothing. I tried to investigate the window, and I heard what sounded like an owl screeching behind me. I saw it looked like an enormous bird flying off in the direction of the dam. But it wasn't a bird. It was far too large to be a bird. It looked like a man. It flew around the bend in the river, and I lost sight of it in the dusk. The radio began going crazy the second I walked back into the shack, with a message coming in and repeating. The dits and dashes were frantically moving across the wires. Rain coming. Stop. Evacuate everyone below South Fork. Stop. Johnstown should seek high ground. Stop. After decoding the final words, the message stopped repeating. This was out of the ordinary, but the message seemed to be urgent. I sent the message along to Johnstown, and it was met with not much regard from the agent there, sending back a message to keep them appraised of the dam. I finally stopped to be shaken by the events of the day, the smiling man in the clearing, and the big bird who was watching me in the radio tower. I changed into dry clothes and hung mine up. Who knows why I was soaked with water and how long I had been gone. I did my best to remain calm through the whole thing. The rest of the night was a blur, but nothing happened. I was relieved when my shift was over and Emma was taking over. May 29, 1889. Anything I should be aware of, George? She said. A storm was coming in from the west. I also had to go and fix the lines yesterday near Bracken's farm and be on the lookout for a suspicious character looming around, wearing a shiny black suit. I had a run-in with him yesterday, and he had an eerie smile, I said. Have you been drinking again? She asked. No. No, I wish it was as simple as that. Keep the agents from here to Johnstown away of the damn status, I said. It's not raining yet, so there should be nothing to report as of now," she said with half a grin. I left the radio tower to head home. I didn't live far, just enough to make it home and pass out on my bed for a few hours. Next station stop, Mineral Point. All aboard! 29 May, in the year of our Lord 1889. From the Diary of Andrew Carnegie It came again, last night. The man-bird, that I thought was only a dream. He was a formidable creature like the legends I heard tale about in my youth, of a man-bird that warned a regiment of Scottish soldiers before their defeat by British troops. At first I was terrified by it, but last night I only felt dread and regret. The last time he seemed to communicate directly to me in my head, telling me things about myself, but this time it spoke to me. The voice of the creature was not something I felt as though I'll ever forget, nor what I tell tale about to my chums. It looked right through me, 
with his piercing red eyes glistening in the firelight and illuminated by the candle on my desk. What man has created and profited from will be the downfall of other men, it said. What in heaven's name do you mean by that? I asked it. The waters of Cornamore will rise with the rain to wash out all below, and you will be branded with the toll. I said. What's rain have to do with me? I asked it. A life of hard work strong as steel can bring forth the folly of leisure and desire. Unearned by the many who see it and feel it. All lost in a break. It said. Spectre, you're speaking riddles to me. What of the rain? I asked it once more. What lay nameless in tomb overlooking tragedy past will forever bear the name of the fifty. Frick. Riley. Rough and Carnegie. It said as its voice raised. The creature spread its immense wingspan and flew at the sight of the balcony. Shaken by the visit, I sat in silence by the fireside with a glass of scotch to calm the nerves in my shaken hands. The visit by the creature must have meant something. But it could only figure by fifty, it meant the club at South Fork. But the dam there is safe. It has withstood many a storm since it was first built for the folly of the canal. I feel it best I ne'er speak of this experience with any soul. May 30th, 1889. The Diary of George Hatch. I relieved Emma in the morning, and the rain had already begun to flow. The thunder and lightning would cause interference in the lines, but messages would still be able to get through. She didn't relay any odd occurrences happening during the day. The morning went by slowly, with rain only coming harder and harder. At about lunchtime, the same telegraph I received two days ago came across again. Rain coming. Stop. Evacuate everyone below South Fork. Stop. Johnstown should seek high ground. Stop. I sent it down the line to Mineral Point, Connemore, and Johnstown. Johnstown sent a message back asking for an update on the conditions of the dam. I made my way to the dam, riding as hard as I could. I could see the water rising steadily. The rain was like thousands of daggers against my skin. I rode back to the radio tower to send a message back down to Johnstown to let them know that it is still intact, but the water is rising. I didn't know where the same message came from. It was odd. The agents at Summerhill Tower were normally less articulate with their messages. I sent a message back to Summer Hill, which was up the line from me, to see if they were just sending it down the line to me from somewhere else. Several minutes later, they sent a message back that said they were having line trouble and just got back in contact and sent no messages in the past few days. My heart sank. Because the messages had come from somewhere, but where? And if the lines were cut on my side, were they cut on the other side also? The rain continued through the night. And the entire time I felt as though someone was watching me from the shadows of the tower. Morning came without incident. And more rain. Emma relieved me early that morning. May 31st, at 1089, the diary of Elias Unger. I woke to find a little Connemore swole by the wren. 
I took my horse to the Erden Dam to see the water cresting up to the point where my horse's hooves were in some of the water from the lake. I rode down a spillway to see a little to gnaw water coming true. I thought back to Hatch warning me days ago that this might happen. And I was short with him. I rode hard back to the club and assembled a work team to unclog the spillway and relive the pressure. We quickly found out the spillway was clogged by a fish structure. Several members of the crew began digging ditches out of the far end of the dam to try to let some of the water go out and set the fess up the dam. Maybe we should cut a second spillway through the top of the dam to relieve the pressure. Do you think that would work? How many men you need? I asked. Second thought, I think that might make the structural integrity of the dam worse. It would definitely collapse if we did that, he said. Yeah, but if we don't do anything at all, it'll certain collapse, I said. I sent Park to deliver a message to the radio tower southward and inform him of his unstable nature of the dam. Then I had men work to build the dam high with mud and rock. But it wasn't working. After being at it for several hours, the unthinkable happened. Damn, let go. It was nearly three o'clock when it happened. It began to spell right in the south of I sat in my own guilt watching as the water poured out the lake. It could only be worse from here, I thought. The water tarred over the building and made its way down the valley. I caught a glimpse of what looked like a giant black bird flying down the valley, head over the water. In the distance, I could hear a train whistle. Blaring. Constantly. I imagine the horrors of what would come of this. I should to think about those of Johnston. The great part got the message through. If only I'd listen to Hatch and sent a crew to look over at the spillway. This could all be prepared. 